Thank you, Ben. It's nice to be able to come into a, a core where they, they do have brass band. Uh, I'm not into brass music by any means, but I appreciate brass band, and I'm privileged to come in and listen to you, especially when you're uh, listening to someone who is the caliber of your band master that's here. I'm sure I know about him, and I've read about him, so I'm going to be really privileged. So the Lord has been good to you for sure. Let me just have a prayer before we begin. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for this Thanksgiving Sunday. The opportunity we have to just come here and worship you and realize that we have so much to be thankful for. But there are so many people today who have to go in hiding to just even speak your name and read your word. But we are here with this freedom this morning, so we just want to thank you for that. Thank you for those who seem fit to come and share in this time of worship. We pray now as we just minister from your word, that indeed you might speak to, through it, and that indeed you might speak through me as you have peace. Ask your lady and your blessing upon all I say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does God care about our giving? Well, stewardship is ultimately about helping the kingdom of God at work here on earth. You will hear me say so many times this week, for those people whom I will be working with, when I promote stewardship across the territory, I'm promoting the importance of honoring God by being stewards of our time, our talents, and our treasures. And, you know, this church can only exist to the extent that you people as a congregation support in those three areas. But stewardship is ultimately about helping the kingdom of God at work here on earth. Now, I'm a I'm a country music fan, by the way. It's a generational thing, I guess. <laughs> My generation tend to enjoy country music. And there is a country song by Randy Travis. It's called The Three Wooden Crosses. I'm sure you must have heard it, all right? That lets us see just that, the kingdom of work of God at work on earth. This song, in classic country form, tells a really good story with a catchy melody and words that rhyme. It's about four people on a bus headed to Mexico. There's a teacher, a farmer, a preacher, and a prostitute. One was headed for vacation, one for higher education, and two who were searching for lost souls. Let's listen to it. Behind you when you go. That's 
story that our preacher told last Sunday. As he held that bloodstained Bible up for all of us to see, he said, That's the farm and the teacher and the preacher who gave this Bible to my mom who read it to me. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there's not four of them, now I guess we know. It's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway. Why there is not four of them? Heaven only knows. And this is the catch. I guess it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. One person survives. Who is it? We don't know it to the first person. But the Course has revealed the parent of this song's message. And the part that really got me was this. It's not what you take, as I just said. When you leave this world behind you, it's what you leave behind you when you go. No one on their deathbed wishes they were more. No one on their deathbed wishes that they had more possessions. No one on their deathbed wishes that they had more fun. Mostly, we wish we spent more time with and touched our loved ones. And most of us, would hope that our lives had some value and that the world was a better place for our having been here. The song continues. Verse 2 says, The farmer left the herbs, a home, and 80 acres. Faith and love for growing things in his young son's heart. And that teacher left her wisdom in the minds of lots of children. Did her best to give them all a better start. And that preacher whispered, can you see your promised land? As he lay his blood-stained Bible in the hooker's hand. Again, you see the song kind of reels us in. We think that the hooker has died holding the Bible, preacher's Bible. But like every good country song, there's a surprise to come. That's the story that our preacher told last Sunday, he says, as he held that blood-stained Bible for all of us to see. He said, bless the farmer and the teacher and the preacher gave this Bible to my mom, who read it to me. I share this song with you because it reminds us that when we are good stewards of what God has given us, as of our time, our talents, our possessions, and our finances, we do not know what impact we can have on someone else. In the song, the farmer leaves a legacy of out of row crops to feed the world through the provision of food. For people to eat. The teacher shares her wisdom with her students who will share it with others. The preacher leaves a Bible with the prostitute who has nothing else. And that prostitute later has a child and she raises her child with that Bible. Her child hears the word of God, becomes a preacher, and shares the good news of the gospel with others. I guess it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind which you when you go. As we get into the stewardship campaign this week, I would ask that all of us reflect a little less on materialism and on consumerism, which infiltrate our lives, and a bit more on what our life purpose really is. What impact do you or do I want to leave on this world? 
Is that promotion more important than attending your kids' soccer games? If you missed that business convention to attend your daughter's recital, will you miss anything of lasting importance? Have you helped someone in need lately? Or have you gone out and bought the newest iPhone or the latest tech gadget? What are you doing? What am I doing to repair this broken world? What are we giving to make a difference? Does our giving really matter? Does anyone really care? Does it make any difference what we give or how much we give? Well, in Mark 12, 41 44, which I read to you a few minutes ago, we see Jesus sitting down opposite the temple treasury and watching the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich, rich people were put in large sums, but a poor widow came and put in just two copper coins, which made a penny. It was all she had. The old bun. It was not something given out of abundance. However, it was as if she had cleaned out her savings and her checking account, took the total withdrawals and dumped them into the treasury. She was now a flat girl. And Jesus was watching. This is one of those stories where we wish Jesus would have gone after the woman and asked her what her gift was all about. But it seemed he knew. He knew that this woman understood something that most of us don't. It did not belong to her. And she gave it all. <coughs> the question is, do you think God knows what you give? Do you think God really cares? Each day, you and I are gifted with 24 hours of time. Do you think that God cares whether or not we share part of that time in an act of love and service for someone else? The talents that you've been given. Does God care whether or not you use those talents to bring light and hope into a world of brokenness? We add money. Does God care whether we are tight fisted or we are generous givers? I think just as Jesus knew about the woman and the two copper coins, God knows about us and our giving. I also think that God cares deeply about our giving. The question is why? First, because God created us in His image. And part of that image is being a giver. John 3.16 reminds us that God sold the world that He gave. We will never be the person God intended for us to be until we learn to give like Him. Secondly, God wants us to have the abundant life. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The reality is that Jesus wants us to have an abundant, self-fulfilled life while we're on this earth. However, abundant means more than having lots of money and stuff. It means having hope, having joy. And the only way it happens is when we give ourselves in the service of others and in the name of Jesus Christ. Generous givers understand what abundant living is all about. God wants us to be able to share in the abundant life right now. Yes, God knows about our giving, and He cares about our giving. Jesus, watching the widow at the treasury, took note of how we give, why we give, and how much we give. The good news is that there is a principle of great equality in our giving. Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. There's nothing unreasonable about that standard. It levels the playing field when it comes to the offering plate. If we have been given much, we should be given to the extent that He blessed us. It is, a rather, it is rather sad, however, to realize that the very opposite of that is true today. In Canada and the United States today, statistics indicate that the more we have, 
the smaller portions of our gifts we give to others. In other words, from an income's perspective, as our incomes are increasing, the percentage of what we are giving as a proportion is decreasing significantly in the last decade. One outstanding preacher put it this way, we have such great expectations of God. We want him to be near in every time of need. We count on him being the one who never slumbers or sleeps. And yet we rarely face the reality that maybe he has great expectations of us as well. Surely, you have some gift that you can give to God. The gift of your heart is the place to start if you haven't already done so. And once you have given in your heart, then you will begin to look for ways to share for your time, your talents, and your treasures, and come to know the abundant life of which Jesus spoke. So may I remind you this morning that your gifts are needed. This core family and the communities in which you live need for you to share your time, your talents, and your money. For in this congregation alone, and we've seen it this morning, there are children to teach, youth to help nurture in faith, adults who need a word of hope and encouragement. There's sick and shut-ins who need to be visited, and those who are grieving to sense that they do not walk alone. Outside this congregation, there are those who need to be fed, to be clothed, have a place to sleep, to be free from violence and fear of their lives. And in the greater world, there are millions who wait to hear the good news of the gospel. And millions who need food, who need clothing, who need medicines to prevent and cure debilitating diseases. And friends, if we do not think these things to be important, and not worthy of our generous gifts of time, talents, and money, then we need to seriously question our Christian community. For this is our call. It is the same Jesus who calls us, who sat by the temple treasury one day and watched the poor widow putting into the offering plate all that she had. So this morning, as you and I reflect on our personal stewardship of time, talents, and treasures, and certainly throughout this week, may God challenge all of us to generous living. Calvin Coolidge once said, no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has always been the reward for what one gave. Jesus cares about you. Jesus also cares about what you do in his name. Jesus wants you, he wants me, to experience the abundant life. The question is, what observation would Jesus make about our giving this morning? Mother Teresa said this, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But the ocean would be less because of that missing drug. It may seem to you that your little part is not that important, but it is. God wants us to give. Not necessarily the quantity of the gift, as I said earlier, but the motivation of the earth is so true. And the challenge for all of us this week, I think, is to just seek God's direction in our lives as we try to do our part to better serve him on this earth and make the earth a better place to live. As the line says, it's not what we take with us when we go. It's what we leave behind that counts. So let's do our part to ensure that we are mending broken lives and mending the broken world. Thank you for listening. Captain Chaz is going to come and he's going to lead us in a beautiful song. Faithful one. So unchanging. Ageless one. You're my rock of peace. We are serving a faithful God. And we're going to be dying this morning. And we hold to him to be faithful to the extent that he's blessed us. God bless you.